Uh, good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices uh, to access committee papers should please ensure that they're switched to silent. Uh, today we have received apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP. The first item of the agenda is a declaration of interest. Annabel Ewing and Kenneth Gibson were appointed to replace Mary Gujon and Richard Lockhead, respectively, as members of the Culture, Tourism and External Affairs Committee. And I'd like to welcome both Kenneth and Annabel to the committee. I now invite Annabel to declare any interest relevant to the remit of this committee. Hey, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure it, it would be relevant, but to adopt a belt and braces approach, I would say simply uh, that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I'm not currently practising. Thank, thank you. you very much, Annabel. And now, Kenneth, would you like to declare any interest relevant to the committee? Thank you, convener. I have nothing to declare. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, we now move on to our second item of business today, which is an evidence session with COSLA and local authority representatives on proposals to introduce a transient visitor levy, perhaps better known as a tourist tax, in Scotland. Uh, this is the committee's first evidence session on the transient visitor levy, uh, and I would like to place on record that we will be having a further evidence session with representatives of the tourist industry uh, in due course. So I'd like to welcome our witnesses today Councillor Gail McGregor, the resources spokesperson for COSLA. Councillor Bill Loban, the convener of Highland Council. Councillor Adam McVeigh, the leader of the City of Edinburgh Council. And Councillor Jenny Lang, the co-leader of Aberdeen City Council. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Um, could I ask you very briefly to say whether, um, in perhaps just in a couple of sentences, before we get into uh, the detail, whether you support a transient visitor levy? I'll start with Gail. Convener, um, on a personal level, I will make no comments. I'm here representing 32 local authorities who have unanimously agreed that we should pursue a transient visitor levy. Councillor Logan. I personally support a transient visitor levy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Edinburgh has had a long-standing commitment to a transient visitor levy, and I'd like to think that my administration last uh, year has taken a slightly more business case-led approach probably from what was traditionally a campaigning approach. So our council has uh, had a long-standing support for it in our programme. And just in the last a few months, the council um, overwhelmingly passed a paper in principle in support of it and with a process to take it forward. Thank you. And Councillor Lang. Thank you. Um, Aberdeen, like Edinburgh, has uh, been looking at this for some time. We had it within our statement of intent when we uh, went into negotiations with Scottish and UK governments back in 2015. Um, we've obviously brought forward uh, reports in various aspects to Council around what that may look like going forward, and uh, we brought it into Scottish Cities Alliance as well. And, uh, you know, we've obviously had uh, other councils come on board and cities uh, in relation to that going forward. Okay, thanks Thanks very much for that. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who have submitted written evidence uh, to the committee, which is very useful. Um, can I ask why a transient visitor levy, in your view, is needed, how much it would raise, and how practically it could be levied? Uh, perhaps we could start with you, Councillor McVeigh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of the scale of of funding, it's probably something in Edinburgh's case of around £11 million. Now, in a grand scheme of a billion pound budget, that might not seem like uh, a lot, but when you think of another key pledge that we're trying to do, build 20,000 affordable homes, and when you think of the council tax revenue that's going to bring, it's going to bring something like 20 to 25 million. So put into context, a transit visitor levy against building 20,000 homes in the council tax revenue from that, actually it starts to look like a, a significant amount of money and the crucial thing for Edinburgh is that it's additional it's additional funds to go towards the additional pressures the additional costs the additional aspirations of our city in regards to tourism and uh, the hospitality sector in particular because we have a probably one of those vibrant hospitality sectors anywhere on the planet it's a fantastically successful thing and it's sustained by a fantastically successful uh, tourism industry but we'd be kidding ourselves if we said that didn't come with significant pressures. And 
the cost of those pressures, one and a half million pounds, for example, just to keep the city centre clean and bins empty during the summer period, the millions of pounds that we put into supporting the festivals through that period, there are additional uh, pressures that come with it. And for us, it would be, uh, I think, fairly crass and fairly wrong to start making budget decisions around continuing that support to enable us to continue that growth, continue that success against decisions in areas such as health and social care and education. I just don't think that would be appropriate. So this is a way of us finding additional revenue to sustain what is an absolutely crucial and and hugely successful part of Edinburgh's economy. And when you think 15, 20 years ago, when uh, these things weren't in the condition that they were now, um, when you track things like Edinburgh's unemployment rate, when you track things like uh, other elements of success, like inward investment, a lot of it's going into hotels being built in the city, everything is garnering more and more success. But we need to find a way, uh, I hope, of sustaining that. And I don't want to be in a position as leader of the city of Edinburgh, where anything is threatening that growth, that success, and that vibrancy in our economy and culture. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Lang, does Aberdeen take a different approach? Um, I think from our perspective, um, when we look at Edinburgh and indeed probably uh, the Highlands as well, they are looking to sustain the tourism that they've already got. I think in Aberdeen we're slightly different because we're looking to build up our leisure tourism. Um, we have very much around uh, hotel occupancy and things in the past. It's been dominated by oil and gas. They've uh, obviously block booked. And when we saw the downturn, we saw the reduction in uh, our occupancy rates. So we were looking as part of our regional economic strategy to diversify our economy. You wouldn't be surprised by that. And tourism is a main element of that. So it is about us trying to build up that leisure tourism aspect. Now, what we've seen is we need to invest. Um, I think we've done as a local authority, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, led the way. We've had major investment in infrastructure. I'm thinking about our 30 million in the art gallery. We've got a new TECA, 330 million pound exhibition centre, various cultural events that we are supporting within the city, whether it be the, the great run, new art, spectra. Um, but, and we understand that, that you know, we need to invest um, in order to achieve that economic growth. But I suppose as a local authority for us, uh, we are dealing with the same pressures as Edinburgh. Uh, um, I would argue maybe a little bit more as the lowest funded council in Scotland. Um, my grant now is probably on a par with uh, the Western Isles, which is a tenth of the population. So we have to look for innovative ways in which we can make sure that that investment continues in the city of Aberdeen to support that sector and others. So from our perspective, we believe that this is a way that locally we can uh, you know, raise revenue, which can then be ring-fenced and actually um, invested in the areas that will help us to support that leisure tourism going forward. Okay, thanks very much. Councillor Loban, obviously you, your authority is very different from the city authorities. Do you have a different approach? Well, I think basically, um, whilst we may have a slightly different approach to some of the major cities, um, we still have the same sort of problems. Obviously, we haven't formally yet considered whether we should have a transient visitor tax or not. Um, but there is massive cross-party support um, throughout the Highland Council Chamber for the introduction of what everyone now calls a tourist tax. But tourism is our main industry, unlike other areas of Scotland. Uh, tourism brings £1.2 billion per annum to Highland. We, we get 6 million visitors and, and, and it supports 20,000 jobs. But the, this increase, you know, it brings pressures on our infrastructure, including roads, parking, public toilets, at a time when council resources are challenging. It's therefore difficult to sustain tourism funding alongside the breadth of essential services the council has to, has to deliver. You know, children's education, et cetera, et cetera. We can't spend money just on tourism in, in preference to something else. You know, our infrastructure is deteriorating. And, and it will lead to a negative impression, and that will cause reputational damage. You know, the, the tourism sector is highly competitive, and it needs to improve constantly, um, just to keep pace with the rest of Europe. You know, we, we face similar issues to the rest of Scotland, but in, in, in the cities of Scotland, 50% of people come to look at the view. In Highland, it's 87%. 
So it's, it really is a, a quite a massive difference over our similarities. You know, facilities that we provide, such as parking, et cetera, et cetera, are exacerbated by, by the tourists. And in some areas, you know, there are more tourist traffic on our roads than there are um, residents. And that makes an immense difference. So what happens is, in fact, the local residents are actually paying for the tourists, and yet who are not providing us with the income. You know, we believe that we need to increase sustainable resources and move to a more dependable long-term solution for funding, which supports our tourism sector, um, and make a high, higher quality visitor experience. Otherwise, we run the risk that visitors just won't come back. You know, council budgets are so constrained now the only way of delivering additional resources is to look at alternative means of funding. Whilst in many other countries uh, around Europe charge a visitor lever, levy, just a few days ago in Paris, I paid two, two euros 53 per person per night. Did it stop me going there? No. Personally speaking, I don't actually accept the argument that visitors will be deterred from visiting the Highlands if we charge them a one pound a night bed levy. In Highlands, we have some of the best food in the world, the best accommodation, and the most magnificent scenery. But all that can come to nothing if the tourist Rex pulls a wheel off his, uh, his car um, or has to go and go to the toilet behind a bush. Um, just to conclude, it's, the growth in, in tourism is very, very welcome, but we're looking for some other way of funding it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McGregor, taking on uh, th those points, um, th the sector, the tourism sector, uh, has made the point that yes, of course, it is a great success story, but we have to be careful of biting the hand that feeds us. And the point that they make is that uh, the level of VAT uh, charged in the UK is higher uh, than other countries, so therefore the tax burden on their industry would be far greater if a transient visitor levy was imposed. The key thing with this is that we all consult with all stakeholders, and I, and I think the tourists tourism industry are engaging very strongly certainly with Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Highland and, and we need to take them with us and, and allow them to appreciate the benefits that could come from this. I think the reality is that it, <clears throat> it's very much about local consultation so there is not going to be one size that fits all that's going to cover all 32 local authorities. It will be very much down to local consultation from local individual councils with their stakeholders, with their partners, with their businesses and with their local population. And I, I think the driver for that has to come from the pressures that Adam has highlighted, the, the issues that Jenny has highlighted and certainly the massive pressures in Highland. Um, it has to be locally led. And, and I think that with a buy-in and appropriate consultation with the tourism industry, and if they see the benefit going back into the community, and they see infrastructure and car parks in the Highlands, which may enhance the visitor experience and all the things that Jenny's highlighted, I'm sure that we can take them with us. But that's part of the conversation. We're, we're in the early stages of the conversation. A lot of work has been done behind the scenes, and now we need to go out and, and really consult with everybody. But it has to be local consultation done on a council by council basis because this is not a one size fits all. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now move to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, Councillor McVeigh said they didn't want to do anything that would threaten the vibrancy of uh, tourism within Edinburgh. And we can see tourism being a success story in Scotland at the moment with increased visitor numbers. I know um, the local authorities have done quite a bit of research into European comparisons and I think the UK is only one of nine countries that don't have a tourist tax out of the EU28. Do you have any evidence of the, um, whether there's been a positive or a negative impact at all on any countries or cities that have introduced tourist tax? And then how would you respond to, Joan McAlpin, the convener, did touch on representation we've had from the Tourism Alliance. How would you respond to concerns that the tourism tax would have a negative impact on visitor numbers? Do you think that's a justifiable concern? I, I think it's a justifiable concern for the industry. I think it's a concern that's easily overcome. Um, when we've looked at impacts post-introduction in other areas, the impact is, is negligible. You're talking low single-digit uh, percentages and increase in terms of demand. Now, when you take a city like Edinburgh, um, our tourism sector is growing each year. The number of people going through the airport is growing each year. The number of people wanting to stay in hotels is growing each year. So. Um, 
as part of our engagement with industry, one of the things we did was had a round table and one person in the industry who's a revenue manager said, we need to be careful about the timing of this because obviously we are, we are down uh, this year from last year. Now, when we pushed that a bit more, what she meant was the growth she was experiencing in her room occupancy and her room rates had slowed. She wasn't saying they were down. They were saying the growth is down, the growth rate is down. Now, any impact uh, of low digits, low single digits um, in terms of tourist numbers in Edinburgh will be absorbed easily with one year's growth, and that's what we're talking about. And actually, I would make the argument very, very strongly that the £11 million pounds of it is around £11 million pounds that we end up investing will go to not only um, counterbalance that, but sustain that level of success, because the threat to the tourism industry in Edinburgh is not a transient visitor levy of a couple of pounds. The threat to the tourism industry in Edinburgh is that, frankly, the city gets to the point that the city starts taking policy decisions to try and mitigate the impact, not in terms of sustaining that success and mitigating the impact of it that way, uh, but mitigating the impact of it by looking at the numbers. And that, for me, as someone who doggedly supports the industry in Edinburgh, is my main concern. I can ask um, Jenny Lang, because Jenny described a different set of circumstances in Aberdeen about trying to grow the tourism sector, um, but the solution you're both arguing for is the same. So how, would you, how does the tourism tax help with growing numbers um, when you're not experiencing the same maybe pressures from tourism numbers as, uh, as Edinburgh are? I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, it's the argument around the, it's the devolving of the powers and what will happen locally may vary depending on what your circumstances are. But as far as Aberdeen goes, um, you know, I mentioned there about the switch that we've had very much from the business uh, tourist to the leisure tourist aspect and particularly the dominance of oil and gas. Um, we've seen a, a rapid reduction in our room rates, uh, nightly rates, already. Um, so, in actual fact, we are much more competitive now than we had been previously. But I think we are managing to attract and grow economically and, and the sector uh, to, to increase because we're making that investment around the tourism offering. Now, whether that's about around marketing the place and what's on offer, or whether it's about the actual investment in the infrastructure and indeed the events that will attract people, but we have to raise that revenue in the first place. Now, my concern, as it is, I think, with across the table here is with reducing budgets year on year is how is local government actually going to be able to sustain those things when uh, you know our statutory duties are increasing and the revenue that we're taking in is reducing so there has to be a local uh, flexibility I would say and it's the wider argument around the devolving of powers and the local accountability in how those monies are spent and um, I think this is just one aspect of it and that's why it featured very much in our statement of intent when we when we put that forward around the city deal was can we provide the levers for, for uh, local government in order for them to stimulate economic growth going forward because that's what will allow cities like Aberdeen and others to be buoyant in the future um, if we have that investment. So, um, as, you know, as far as putting people off, I don't see that at all. You know, I mean, we've heard here about uh, aspects of people going and you pay it. I've done it myself. But the other aspect, I suppose, is we have the argument with the VAT and the, and the transient uh, visitor levy on top. But when you look, other countries, their VAT levels might be lower, but when they're combined, they're on a par with what is being suggested by people here when you bring the two together. But you have that opportunity to spend that money locally on the issues that might affect uh, your local authority, which may be different in Aberdeen than it would be in Edinburgh and indeed in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, did you have a supplementary? Well, it was a, basically it was a question uh, uh, um, looking at uh, the way that this impacts across Scotland, because in the cause of submission it says, uh, you've said, and I quote, we need to be innovative about funding for public services. So it looks like this is additional money for public services. You see, this is not a replacement for existing funding, but will provide important additionality over and above existing funding streams. And then paragraph four, you say, non-domestic rates are not devolved to a local level. Now, non-domestic rates were pooled in Scotland because cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, benefited disproportionately from rates, and people from, for example, Glasgow, um, 
you know, Inverclyde, North, North Ayrshire, North Lanarkshire, all went in and spent their money in Glasgow. So it was decided to pool them so that those resources could be more evenly spread. The issue about tourism, I, I think, is something which um, has been touched on so far in any of the submissions, is that some local authorities, such as, for example, Highland, Galloway, uh, Aberdeen, uh, Edinburgh, will, will, will probably benefit significantly. But, but will North Lanarkshire, will Western Bartonshire, will Clackmannanshire, and, and this could create a disproportion in terms of the resources available to some councils relative to others. So I'm wondering whether or not... I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but whether you feel like non-domestic rates, there should be an element of pooling, or or indeed um, you take the view that, well, you know, uh, the issues in, uh, you know, of, um, you know, congestion, for example, in, in Fort Augustus or in a grass market or, 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 or in Dumfries High Street or for our um, local authorities to resolve there, for we should keep all the, res all, all the revenue. Because it seems to me that it doesn't provide much flexibility for some councils, only for the ones where there is already a large uh, tourist income coming in. Thank you. Um, I think the importance of this, as I said earlier on, is about local discretion. So we have 32 local authorities, all very different, all with very different challenges, but we do have areas which are incredibly pressured through tourism, such as Edinburgh and the Highlands. The principle of this is to enable them to offset some of the, you know, the, the pressures they have as a consequence of tourism. And, and I think it's incredibly important that locally, local leaders, local communities are able to make that decision to, to raise additional income, which can then be spent directly back out in their communities to enhance um, the tourist experience. In the other areas, probably circa 25 plus local authorities, it may never be implemented, never. But we need to have the local power to implement it if it would work for a local area. So I, I think the, the pressure that comes, particularly in Edinburgh, and uh, you, know, you speak to taxi drivers, I spoke to one coming in this morning, and the pressures in Edinburgh are immense, and therefore the pressures on the council are immense. Borders don't have the same pressure with tourism. You know, Argyll and Buttes have a different type of pressure. It, it's not particularly hotel-related or rooms-based. Um, it's more use of, of roads and camping sites. And, and I think that the whole principle is about local consultation, local discretion, and the ability, if, if it fits, to enable that local authority to levy a transient visitor tax. And, and, and indeed, the amount will be at the discretion of the local authority as well. So I don't think there's any requirement to have a national pot as such. Um, it would be very much down to local accountability and Adam's neck on the line at the next election if it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but that's the reality. It's about local accountability and local consultation. And if it's going to work for that authority, they should be able to implement it. And if it's not going to work for an authority, they simply won't. It's not about whether it'll work, it's about whether or not they've got the tourists actually turning up that will actually make it work. I mean, sh I mean, the point I was trying to make is that this will uh, increase the disproportionality that we already have within Scotland between prosperous areas and less prosperous areas. And that's why I was just wondering uh, whether or not pooling would maybe perhaps be a way of, of, of resolving that to some extent, because otherwise some areas won't benefit. And to say that, you know, I mean, clearly... Uh, um, uh, although there's all talk about pressures, etc., and I fully understand that we only have to walk up, you know, the, the 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 Royal Mile any day of the week. You can see the number of tourists and all that. You know, sometimes you can't even walk in a straight line from buffet you into the, into, into the street. But that is a that is a success, and, and you know, 35,000 jobs are already provided in Edinburgh. Colossal amounts of money come into Edinburgh through tourism, and this would surely you know, widen that gap between, uh, for example, Edinburgh and other surrounding authorities unless there was some kind of pooling. That's the, the only point I was, I was trying to uh, make. And people from, you know, Western Bartons or North Lanarkshire, etc., themselves go uh, on holiday in uh, Edinburgh and the Highlands and other parts of Scotland and already spend some of their hard-earned money there. So uh, um, I, I'm just wondering if that's something that would be perhaps given further consideration. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, it's... Uh, it, it's a useful question, and particularly in relation to 35,000 jobs, I wanted to make a specific point, because what the industry has not been good at in Edinburgh, frankly, is doing the uh, hard work in terms of skills generation. So linking the communities that need access to those jobs most with the um, actually highly transient workforce that is in uh, the economy. 
and actually a, an additional £11 million with industry saying they would love a proper skills programme that took uh, more local people into to give them a, a career in the industry is one of the things that we'd absolutely be open to discussing. But this is about the why. I think your question really speaks to the why we are progressing this. We're not progressing this as Edinburgh just so that we can get an additional £11 million in uh, funding for our local authority. We're progressing it because we think that's the best way of funding the continued success of that. And if we're going to pull the revenues, then let's pull the costs. Mm -hmm. And the costs that are on Edinburgh in terms of sustaining that um, economy. If you said to my colleagues in Midlothian and East Lothian, do you want to start um, paying a bit more towards Edinburgh's uh, funding for the festivals and Edinburgh's crowd management and place management? I, I can, I'm sure I know what their answer would be, um, and I'm sure. The vastly exceeds the costs. I think that's. Yeah, I think we're going to have to move on. Members <laughs> want to come in. Jamie Green. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Gavino. I have a few um, different questions. I'll try and keep them brief. Um, Councillor McVeigh, in your submission, you say that local authorities should have the power to, and discretion to raise additional income uh, by levying tax in addition to council tax and non-domestic rates on either resident, property owners or visitors in the local authority or within discrete areas of that local authority. Which additional tax raising powers are you thinking about? This one, <laughs> um, but we also have in our programme, for example, our programme in Edinburgh, our workplace parking levy, which we don't have the ability to levy now, but because of the way Edinburgh's transport system uh, is structured, because of the movements from the north of the city, the south, east and west, uh, that's something that we're progressing to make sure people make the right choices coming into the city to relieve traffic pressures, to also give us the ability to take space, uh, frankly, away from car across the city where possible and create more valuable space with it, be that active travel um, or just generally public space. Okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, can I ask uh, what the various councils think they're going to do with the money? Um, £11 million pounds seems a relatively small amount of money in the grand scheme of things to Edinburgh and I suspect probably much less in potential in intake for smaller uh, local authorities with less tourists. Um, are you going to a ring fence the money to be reinvested back into the tourism industry, or b is it going to be used to build affordable homes, or uh, filling potholes, other infrastructure projects which should be funded perhaps from other areas of local authorities' budget, or is it just going to get sucked into the wider uh, local authority budget and, and just be seen as a top-up tax? You don't need to press your buttons, by the way, just for the benefit of Sound Man. You know, from, from the point of view of Highland, um, tourism is our main industry. We estimate that a, a £1 a night would generate roughly £12 million. Now, if we take that as revenue funding, it's £12 million a year. If, if we actually capitalised it, that would give us something like £120 million to spend um, on capital projects. Toilets, car parks... Um, Roads, etc. Um, there are many, many things that we would wish to discuss with the public and the industry as to how we should spend that money. Um, there are a wide variety of projects, but basically the tourist uses the same sort of facilities that the public does. But yet the public pays, but the tourist doesn't. Now it doesn't matter whether the tourist comes from North Lanarkshire to Highland or whether they come from Spain or, or Switzerland. The simple fact of life is the provision of these services costs money and we have to find a way of making the tourist happy to come and spend their money. Um, and, and for me, it, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, as far as, you know, the, the information that we've obviously supplied to you and, uh, you know, when we've gone into discussions with various groups, it has always been that we would look to ring fence the money specifically for the tourism sector and uh, you know uh, the investment that we're making in the city in order to attract visitors um, there. I suppose what I need to point out as well is currently um, you know we do we've got about half a million well about almost six hundred thousand pounds going into our visit Aberdeenshire organization which is there to promote the destination um, around marketing and various other aspects and we have uh, 
money on top of that that goes into different events. But that money actually levers in private investment as well, and also investment from our neighbouring authority, um, Aberdeenshire. And my concern would be, because it, it, the, particularly the private investment is predicated on that investment being made by the local authorities. So it's very important to us, you know, particularly as our budgets get tighter, that we have that uh, money available in order to invest in those areas, because it wouldn't just be the local government investment that could be lost, it could be the investment coming from the private sector as well. I mean, it sounds to me there's some disparity around how each individual council would look to spend that money, you know, reinvesting it back into promoting the area, for example, into marketing uh, schemes, that sounds like a very positive one, using it to reverse closures of public toilets or, or, or fixed roads, uh, which one could suggest should be being done anyway uh, from, from your existing budgets or, or asking for, for, for more budget elsewhere. Um, the idea that the tourist doesn't pay for these things, well, I think in your opening statement you said it brings over a billion pounds of revenue from tourism into, to, into your area. So wouldn't you say that they already are paying uh, for these services uh, by the additional income that they're bringing? I think that there's no doubt about it that the tourist does bring additional income. It brings additional income to tourist operators, um, etc. However, what it doesn't do is, is bring additional income to the local authority to provide the, the services that we provide for the tourist. Um, you know, there are areas for, in, in Highland, for example, the North Coast 500, the mm -hmm. famous road route, which has seen an exponential increase in the number of visitors. Um, Highland Council are responsible for main, maintaining that road. Uh, they're maintaining that road in general in previous years for the use of, of, of local residents, whereas now it's for the use of massive numbers of tourists. And I don't think it's unjustified to expect um, the tourists to contribute towards that. But also, it, it's not unjustified that, that we would spend a lot more money in promoting the Highlands to bring even more tourists. Um, and it, it's such an important subject to us. And just maybe perhaps final question. Um, it's no huge surprise uh, that if you ask a local authority, would you like an additional tax raising power to generate more revenue, the answer is yes. Uh, I'm not hugely surprised to hear that. However, if you ask business, uh, especially small businesses who are actually uh, generating revenue from tourism, uh, they seem to be hugely against this prospect. Uh, two thirds of uh, respondents to an FSB uh, survey said it would be negative to their business, uh, and three quarters said it would have a, a not just a negative effect in their business, but on the general local economy. How do you respond to those businesses? Is it worth? That? Me responding because we've done quite a lot of work with the industry and actually um, we've had a very mixed bag of uh, comments. Even today we are um, doing a, a session with uh, specific uh, with the industry including the Federation of um, uh, Small Business including the Association of Self Caterers for example on the mechanism that we would use because what we heard very clearly from business was actually if the if the amount that's charged is fairly small and it's easy to administer, then a lot of the problems that some of the businesses fear actually dissipate. So one of the things we're doing right now is literally today, our Polish officers are working with industry to say, well, how do you want it best administered? What's easiest for your business so that, that administrative burden is at an absolute minimum? And just to pick up on the, the FSB um, survey that that you highlighted one in four businesses that responded to that said they supported. Now, I think that's a pretty good starting point. When you ask any business, uh, do you want to pay more tax? The answer is usually no, but one in four in this... Yeah, one in three four, four say no. One so in that, four in this yeah. case saying yes is, is quite a high rate of uh, businesses willing to pay more. And just in the research that we've published today from our uh, Mark in Edinburgh body, um, a vast majority of tourists actually say they would be happy to pay the charge in Edinburgh. Now, it's not often you ask individuals would be willing to pay more tax, and they respond yes, especially tourists who are here for a couple of days, a week, um, etc. But those people have responded in the affirmative to say they'd be happy to pay it. In terms of priorities, because I think it is an important point to mention things like roads and, and public toilets, it's important to recognise that the priorities for local authorities in terms of residents and sustaining our public services could be different for sustaining uh, and, uh, and investing in our tourist economies. And in Edinburgh, 
uh, we are looking at uh, obviously um, some financial challenges. Everyone is, and the decisions are being motivated by our guiding principles. And our guiding principles are um, an inclusive, fair economy that works for our communities. Now, obviously, the success of tourism is a huge part in that. But it is very difficult as a local authority to balance sustained investment for uh, mass availability of high quality public toilets, for example, and social care services. It's just a difficult decision process to be in. And this speaks to a process which is an alternative to that, which I think sustains our success and gives us a revenue stream to invest in the future. Thanks very much. Ross Greer. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I feel like we've almost skipped a, a stage in this debate because the, the first stage is about the principle of is this a power that local authorities should have the ability to exercise before we have a debate about whether or not any individual authority should exercise it. But given that we're the Tourism Committee, not the Local Government Committee, I suppose that was inevitable. So that being said, um, Councillor Wobins um, detailed the, the pressures on Highland Council in terms of roads, parking, public toilets, etc. Um, I was wondering if Councillor McVeigh and, and Lang could detail if the pressure on city councils, and obviously particularly for Edinburgh where it's a really unique situation, if there's a different kind of pressure on the services that you provide as a result of what is uh, mass tourism being an international city? I mean, yes, absolutely. In terms of placemaking, in terms of making our city just function the way it should, um, managing that number of people takes an incredible amount of effort. Not all that is seen, not all that's particularly visible. But managing those core services, the things that you don't notice until the bin is massively overflowing, for example, uh, the bit of um, public realm control that you don't really realise until you're absolutely swamped with pedestrians on a pavement that's uh, one and a half metres wide. These are the things that I think we need to provide additional um, support to. And if we are going to continue to grow and sustain this industry, grow and sustain our tourist economy, these are the things that we need additional revenue to put towards. A lot of that is quite intangible. It's quite difficult to, um, it's a difficult sell, and I appreciate it's a difficult sell to the industry as well, but it's absolutely crucial if we're going to talk about increasing the capacity of the city. To give you just one example, in our budget last year, we put a million pounds in capital to a new venue in Lee Theatre. Now, the motivation for that was to create a, a vibrant cultural um, centre uh, just happened to be in my ward, uh, but it was to create a new, additional, vibrant um, cultural centre. This year, uh, in the International Festival, they put on a programme there, which spread their offering, um, their cultural offering, throughout our city. Now, that's really helpful, actually, if you're going to manage to grow your tourist numbers, to continue to grow that level of success. It's helpful to spread that uh, impact um, across the city, but that will take additional investment to do. It will take additional capital investment and additional venues, and it will take additional revenue investment to how best you then manage that spread of uh, visitor population. So there are a whole host of costs, and some of them are quite acute, some of them are not particularly visible, but there's a whole host of things in Edinburgh, and I would say um, some of them are the same. You know, I, I don't anticipate necessarily the roads of Edinburgh being the first thing that this revenue is spent on, but there may be acute areas where the industry is saying this is what we want you to spend it on for the good of X and Y, and it will be a very business-led, um, business-case-led decision-making process. Thank you. And just to move on to the, the mechanism somewhat, there's unique challenges in some local authorities. In fact, Highland and Edinburgh are very good examples uh, of... Um, short-term lets, the Airbnb kind of model. How would you envisage a mechanism for collection that ensures that uh, those who are visiting your areas using uh, short-term lets in this more informal economy um, are still paying at the same rate as someone who would use a traditional hotel or B&B? I mean, it's, it's, it's worth saying we've engaged directly with Airbnb, who are supportive of what we're trying to do. They make up more than 50% of the market in Edinburgh, so they have more than 50% of the control. Um, they would be happy to apply a, a transient visitor levy. I think it should be applied regulatory to the industry so that it's not uh, reliant on Airbnb's uh, goodwill, although we're very pleased to have their goodwill. Um, the impact on uh, that industry will be absolutely uh, negligible and very easy to control because it can be controlled through... Um, particularly the, the booking platforms, but I think that has to be done on a regulatory basis.
basis, and I should say Airbnb are also taking part in our discussion today as we're discussing the mechanism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I just, um, before I get into my questions, Mr. Bobin, uh, Councillor Bobin, sorry, you, you mentioned, sorry, Lobin, you mentioned something a few moments ago regarding the North Coast 500 uh, and the, the additional uh, level of uh, uh, traffic uh, and also and tourists. Uh, that additional revenue that comes in, does that actually cover the cost of the maintenance uh, of that particular road? No, it doesn't. Um, there is no contribution towards the cost of the additional road. Oh, but there, there, there is obviously um, uh, direct taxation uh, where the VAT, etc., will, will come to, uh, to central government, but there is no direct input uh, due to the additional traffic. Um, unlike, uh, unfortunately, some countries, we, we don't have a tax um, on tourists to, to use our roads. Mm -hmm. so of, in terms of the additional take that will come into the, the economy and money that will be circulated around the economy, uh, and uh, uh, within that particular part uh, of uh, the Highland area. Uh, does, that, uh, has, does that have an economic benefit? Oh, it's a fantastic economic benefit. And, and, I, and I must stress, you know, um, in, in other parts of Scotland, you, you have massive industries. In, in Highland, our massive industry is tourism. But I think the one thing, if, if you just take that specific road, you could have, for example, um, a, a small village of 100 or so people. But it's right next to a, 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 a massive tourist um, uh, visitor centre. But you wouldn't build a, a toilet for 150 or 200 people, but you will build one or keep one open for 50,000 tourists. So it's, I, there, is, there has to be some way, surely, of tying the, the cost to the revenue. And at the moment, I don't believe there is. Okay. Uh, Certainly, the discussion uh, today has been about uh, hotel beds. Now, I represent Greenock and Inverclyde, and uh, certainly in recent years there has been an increasing number of cruise ships that have came in. Uh, and obviously, um, the folk come in on cruise ships, they don't stay overnight. Uh, so in terms of, has there been any discussions within COSLA uh, regarding, uh, in terms of some type, any type of mechanism to go forward? Uh, could it be considered that uh, any, anyone who, who disembarks from a cruise ship that they could pay a particular uh, tourism uh, tax or as compared to uh, a pound on a, on a hotel bed. Thank you. At the moment, obviously, we've focused on local authorities who have done a lot of legwork and, and an awful lot of consultation to get to this stage. Again, we're going back to the principle of local discretion. So what would suit Edinburgh, which may be room-based, and, and, that, and that would be the model they would use? It would be down to, to your local area to maybe look at another model that would apply to your cruise ships coming in. And I think the, the point here is that it's about local discretion. It's about local people making local decisions for the betterment of their area. Um, we certainly have a, a similar issue on Orkney as well. And, and I think that that's the beauty of something which isn't set in stone, that all 32 local authorities can do something or they can do nothing. And, and you are not going to have a model for Aberdeen that is exactly the same as Edinburgh. So certainly in your area, if there's a pressure with cruise ships, that's potentially something that your local council could look at and develop and consult on and develop further if, if required. And if not, they wouldn't implement it. So I, I think, you know, we have pressures inland and, you know, around the coast. But the key thing here is giving local people the discretion to raise income, to deal with those pressures as is fit for that area. I think I mean, it's just to uh, reiterate what Gail has said there. I think this is where it's very important about the local flexibility, mm -hmm. because I think there will be different circumstances for different places. Um, I, I don't know whether you're aware, but we've currently got a large harbour um, infrastructure investment going ahead in Aberdeen, which is with the prime uh, intention, or one of the prime intentions, um, to bring in cruise ships for the first time providing that deep water. But we're obviously looking at that and how we shape up that going forward. It wouldn't be our intention now to look at levying any kind of tax on the cruise ships because we don't feel that that would be uh, the way to go for us at the moment. So, it, But it may be that in other places they feel that that would be different. But I think that's about the local accountability as well because I think everybody sitting around the table um, understands that if, if the powers are granted to local authorities, that's when the legwork then starts. Um, you, because obviously we are not going to bring forward anything that we think will, oh, I'm certainly not, that I feel will have an impact on the economic growth of my 
my city and the region. And I won't be bringing anything forward that I don't feel can't be fully embraced by business and indeed residents in the city, um, because we will need to be accountable to them moving forward. So uh, it's about us having the power in which to go forward with those negotiations and then shape things up that suit your local economy. Certainly, just to be clear, there are no pressures in terms of the cruise ships coming in. Uh, I warmly welcome them. Where my constituency office is, uh, we tend to be uh, a really busy office when the ship comes in, because um, it's just it's an ideal location for them, and the more that come in, the better. Um, but just in terms of the, uh, in terms of that offer, um, and also any revenue that, uh, that could be generated, uh, I suspect I know what the answer is going to be from all four of you in this, but. Um, do you genuinely believe that local authorities are the best body to then invest that money? Uh, could it not actually go to maybe a DMO or some other, uh, other organisation within a particular, a particular area to actually invest it in the tourism take and, and the tourism offer? Because, um, certainly as comments from uh, uh, Jamie Green earlier just regarding some of the investment, um, it could be seen that anything could then be badged up as, well, that's going to help tourism, whether it's toilets, whether it's roads, whether it's whatever else. So are local authorities really uh, impartial enough to make sure that money is invested in the tourism offer? I think local authorities understand, you know, through success, where the pressures are lying at the moment, and I, and I think it's usually incumbent on them to deal with it as well. There are authorities who are looking at perhaps having an overarching board or body to, to disperse those funds. I'll let my colleagues from Edinburgh and Aberdeen, because I think you've done a bit of work on this speak. But again, it, it's, it, you're bringing in income to plug a gap that we have in local authorities' budgets at the moment. We simply don't have enough budget across the piece to cover all of the services that we would like to cover. And we have a lot of statutory duties now within education and social care where we have massive pressures. And I think this is an opportunity simply to enhance our local areas and actually do something to help them flourish, bring in a little bit of additional income and then make sure at local level, because yes, we do know best at local level, that that money is spent where it absolutely needs to be spent. If it's done from a higher level, then I think you get into a situation where it maybe wouldn't be getting spent where it needs to be spent. I mean, we have done a lot of work on the, the governance of it and have concluded that the council um, making that final decision is, is the best place for it to sit. Um, however, we have explored how we best engage with key stakeholders, the industry, the sector, to get, to get the right actions um, from it. And we've explored things like uh, sounding boards yeah. and using the Edinburgh Tourism Action Group, for example, as a sounding board for those, um, for those actions. But to be clear and why I don't think uh, the decision should sit with a body like that rather than the council, many of the pressures that come... Um, are certainly driven by the, the tourism industry um, and the, the tourist economy. But some of the biggest effects are on the residential population. And there will be a balance and some actions, um, all actions will be about supporting and enhancing the success of the tourist economy. But not all might be exclusively for the tourist. It will be about relieving and addressing the pressures so that we can continue to grow and sustain uh, what is an incredibly vibrant part of our economy. So the, the balanced approach that councils will take, and I think councils are the best uh, people to understand where that is, they will understand where, for instance, they need to invest in new areas of uh, tourism development, for example. Um, think of Edinburgh as an example around Craig Miller Castle that isn't as accessible as Edinburgh Castle, for example, but if we wanted to develop that as a real tourism destination to spread that benefit, you might get some vested interest from the hotels that are in the city centre thinking that might not be the best thing to do, but the council would be best placed to make that decision. But ultimately, there has to be a, a strong input from the industry, a strong input from key stakeholders to make sure there's that voice very strongly held through the process to ensure it's ultimately uh, additional funding for additional purposes. But exactly what that is tailored to, I think councils are absolutely best placed to decide. Thank you. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, councillors, and thank you for coming in. I think we've been having a very interesting discussion. Now, references have been made, I think, by all of you about engagement, which, of course, is extremely important. But could I just perhaps quote 
from a letter that the committee received, I believe, yesterday uh, from the Scottish Tourism Alliance and UK Hospitality. I'm sure this will be available publicly. Yes, so you will get to see this. And could I just quote on the subject of engagement where they say, uh, local authority interests have uh, thus far failed meaningfully to consult with the industry on their proposals. So it would be interesting to hear if you feel that is a fair statement or not, and perhaps if you feel that notwithstanding your initial response to that, there may be more work to do as regards engagement. Could I address that? Because I'm aware the STA did have comments about Edinburgh's engagement, which I have to say I don't recognise. Um, members of the STA have sat in the round tables that we have uh, led. The STA themselves had a rep just two days ago at the Edinburgh Tourism um, Action Group, where one of my senior policy officers went through these proposals uh, in detail to get uh, feedback. So I don't recognise, if they've sent that yesterday, I think that's unfortunate timing for them to put that in writing, because I do not recognise that um, situation at all. Uh, our door has been absolutely open, so some of the organisations, for example, the Association of Self-Caterers, as well as taking part in a roundtable event, followed up with me directly afterwards, and I had a meeting with them to go through some of the more specifics uh, and hear their uh, voice, their concerns, and also some of their um, issues that they were bringing forward. More than happy to do so with anyone else. And can I say this is a, a two-way process of engagement. The event today um, is looking, at, there's however many uh, people from the industry that will take part in that and help shape it. That requires the industry to take part and engage. And where there are people in the industry who think that they can just pretend we don't exist, avoid engagement and therefore make all this go away by refusing to take part in it, I think is potentially quite an unfortunate route for some organisations to go down. So we are absolutely keeping the door open. We are doing as much outreach as we can. And I should say, this process has been, that we've led to date, as much as it's been open and tried to engage with as many people as possible, this has been a, an informal process of engagement to try and best shape our proposals. The next phase is taking a report to the committee that I chair in the council, which will then lead a, a widespread consultation in the city. And that will be looking in a much more mass way to engage with literally every resident, every tourist who wants to take part in that, and every person in the industry who wants to directly have their say on what we're proposing. So um, I don't recognise what they have uh, put in writing uh, at all. Um, and I also think that the process we have uh, lined out has given plenty of opportunity to date and will give a really robust opportunity for engagement as we start our consultation process going forward. Okay, other views? We, we're not actually as far down the line as, as Edinburgh is, and there's no doubt about that. But, but the engagement with not just the industry, but members of the public um, is fundamental to the whole process. We can't take this forward in, in any way unless we, we consult it at every possible level. And you know our tourism working group. The, their next proposal will be is how we engage with both industry and and especially with members of the public. And and it's it's quite simple. And um, we, we cannot progress unless we consult. But it is, as Adam said, a two way street. You know we we have been in dialogue with with some of our larger hotel groups, and um, one of whom already charges a bed tax, which he donates to charity, his own charity. But um, so th there are differing opinions out there, and we need to hear them. I think just further to that, from COSLA's perspective, obviously um, the local authorities that we're working with have done, an, as Adam says, an awful lot of the informal legwork, if you like. Uh, and I think that was really important in shaping what we took to leaders a couple of months ago and the mandate that, that we were given to progress this and following the press launch a couple of months ago it's obviously ramped things up slightly and it means that we are now going into a far more formal process of consultation but just to give reassurances because again I don't recognise this um, COSLA has met with both those um, bodies um, over the summer and they're both invited to a round table at the end of the month so I think where we've got to up to about June July 
was a lot of work that had been done by individual local authorities. COSLA now has a mandate um, with 32 leaders behind us, um, and we now move into a far more formal process um, in ensuring that every stakeholder is consulted along the way. But we have met with them, and we're meeting with them again at the end of the month. Good. We've obviously had um, informal uh, discussions and uh, meetings with the local uh, representatives of the different bodies. I have to say it's more positive than we're seeing coming from the national level. Um, they obviously have come forward with uh, issues around where their concerns may lie. Um, I think Adam um, mentioned earlier around the administration and how that would work. And obviously, as a local authority, we've gone away to look at how that could be done going forward to try and address those concerns. They've obviously raised the issue about the amounts that might be involved. And again, that's probably what shaped up the proposals that, that we've brought forward. So um, from our perspective, I have to say that the um, local uh, negotiations have been far more positive than perhaps we're seeing from uh, correspondence and things that's coming out at a national level. And I think it highlights the fact that we were raising earlier that there will be different circumstances in different places in Scotland. And that's why the argument, I suppose, coming from us is it's about the devolving of that power and then up to local um, uh, authorities to make and determine whether they wish to use that or not going forward. And they'll it will be determined by what uh, people in the localities are saying, whether it be the business side or indeed the residents, as we've heard from others. Okay, well, that's very uh, interesting to hear. Obviously, there seem to be certain differences in view, but it, it is encouraging at least to hear that you, you feel determined that uh, you recognise certainly that engagement is, is a key part of this process. Can I just ask very quickly as a follow-up, um, in terms of the nature of that in engagement, um, obviously, we have seen from the, the, the submissions that a concern that has been raised by industry relates to the interplay of what is a very high VAT rate on tourism imposed by the UK government, double that of, on average of, of all other, most other European Union countries, and the interplay of that uh, tax burden with uh, a potential tourist uh, levy. Uh, and, you know, that is, to me, it seems an assumption of what consumer behaviour will be, because it is the consumer who will pay the consumer levy. So I just wonder, in that regard, what has been done already or what you may plan to do to, to try to get an evidence base to this in terms of consumer behaviour, uh, looking perhaps at other international examples, because it is the consumer who will pay, and therefore I would have thought it would be key uh, to uh, 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 this issue uh, as to what uh, likely impact on consumer behaviour a tourism uh, tax would have. I don't know if there's any comments, Adam. I mean, in the research that we've published today, or Marketing Edinburgh has published today, 97% um, of visitors in Edinburgh who were surveyed uh, said they would um, come back to Edinburgh if there was a... To say briefly, uh, convener, I, I mean in that regard, you know, where there has already been, uh, because it's all very well to take a survey of people walking around the high street but in Edinburgh, but where there already has been the, um, the introduction of a tourist tax in other countries, presumably they have taken stock and, and there have been analyses conducted as to what impact, if any, there has been on their tourism numbers. I don't know, has there work been done uh, yes, in that regard? Yes, yeah, uh, apologies. I, I mentioned, I think, in my first answer that the um, research points, and it depends because different places have brought in different rates, for example. So um, having been in Italy last week, I paid um, four different uh, yeah. tourist rates, and one was six euros a night per person, uh, and one was one euro fifty a night per person. So it depends what rates people have brought in, but the cumulative um, effect is in the low single digits. You're talking about one, two, three percent if you're getting up to the, the higher rates. So, um, and that is mirrored by the information that we've got by asking people who are visiting Edinburgh. Interestingly, when you ask them the question, would they pay? Uh, a pound a night and come back, you get almost everyone. When you start increasing that number, you do start to see it affecting mm -hmm. uh, demand, as you would expect. So people, when you start asking them, would you pay £10 a night, that number starts to tail off and it starts to very clearly have an impact on people's decisions about with, whether they would stay there or not. So there has to be a business case-led process that says, where is the price elasticity within this? Um, and making sure that we end up picking a, a number in a regime which doesn't negatively affect that supply. So I completely agree 
um, with the, the subtext of your question, what I would say in relation to Edinburgh's market, which is, again, I think different to, uh, well, actually, maybe quite similar to, to the Highlands in a way, is the elasticity of price is absolutely enormous. Rooms can go, um, and if you walk down Southbridge, you'll see a hotel with a, a room rate uh, that's digitised and on their front door. And it's a very clear, visible on-street reminder of how elastic our price is, because it can go from around 50 quid to around 300 pounds within the space of a couple of weeks. And it's very much driven by where the market is. So during the festival, people are paying a lot of money for fairly basic rooms. During low season, people are paying uh, not very much or a lot less for some fantastic rooms in Edinburgh. It's a great place to come to get a bargain if you want to come in January or February. So um, the elasticity of price is absolutely key and we need to stress test exactly what we're going to pitch at Edinburgh's proposal is for a fairly low rate. People won't pay more than they would pay for a cup of coffee during their visit at the end of their bill. Um, and we're proposing to cap that at seven nights as well, meaning people who are here for business on a more long-term basis would only pay for the first seven nights of their stay, for example. So the fairness element in it, I think, will mean that we end up with something that hits that equilibrium point of not affecting the market. Sorry, I think evidence has shown that there's a very low impact. We, we, we've, we've mapped a lot of countries across mainland Europe as a comparison. And, and as an example, um, Rome has a 10% VAT rate, but by the time you apply the overnight charge, it takes up to 26%, which is in excess of our VAT rate. And, and I think we see that across many other major European cities um, who do have the, the benefit of tourism. So I, I think what has come up in the evidence is that it has a very low impact on visitors because they're going there for a visitor experience and it's far more than just price but I think Adam's absolutely right and further to that the local authority will work out what that particular industry in that area can cope with and it may even be seasonal they may only apply the levy from April till October in the busy periods I think the entire point here is it's about local knowledge and local discretion um, but certainly it's a low impact in, in other European cities. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Kenya. We've already touched on many of the research that you've done so far, so can I start tease out that a little bit? Uh, you've yet to persuade the industry that this is a, a, a good idea. They see it as a, a burden or a, an extra burden on them. Uh, it would appear you're yet to persuade the Scottish Government also that this is uh, a positive thing that should be introduced. Now, can I ask about how you in would envisage the Scottish Government managing to deal with legislation uh, to ensure that this could happen? I mean, in, in terms of the um, legislation, I'm quite comfortable um, that this is a business case-led uh, process. I'm quite comfortable, and I think uh, we would all be with that, of some form of um, scrutiny to that to make sure that things weren't being brought in uh, ideologically, if I can phrase it that way, rather than uh, in terms of a, a robust and sensible and professional um, business case which uh, sustains the success of an individual economy. So um, in terms of the legislation, I'm not going to tell the Scottish Government how to write it. Uh, that's entirely a matter for them. Um, my job is to outline and take forward as robust a Edinburgh proposal as, pros as possible and feed that into the legislative process so that uh, MSP colleagues and the Scottish Government can then put forward um, legislation to hopefully give us that power of implementation. I think it's really important to hear from Adam because you know he, he's very much at the front of this, but the, the reality is that in my role at COSLA, I've been engaging with the Scottish Government for about a year now on this, specifically with the Minister for Finance and the Constitution at the time. Um, we've had many discussions cross-party with all political groups in Holyrood, and, and I think the important thing here is that we have the conversation. It's not about us saying, we must have, we must have. It's about us all getting together around the table for the betterment of our local areas and having that discussion, and we'll continue to do that. We're just at the beginning of the process, as Annabelle has pointed out. There's far more cons consultation needs to be done, but the key thing is that we take everybody with us, and, and we eventually persuade everybody that it is a good idea for those who do want to use it, but it's not for everybody. And, and I think those discussions with both Scottish Government and all political parties across the entire Parliament are absolutely essential. Um, you can't make a decision without the fullest of information. And following on from that, 
do you think it, it, you've made some very strong cases for Edinburgh, uh, and I think that's one of the strongest cases we've seen in some of the evidence we've looked at, uh, where others have are still f working their way through that process as to how they would manage that. Do you think it should be yourself uh, as the council who, who negotiates, or should it be COSLA who takes that lead role to ensure that all local authorities are, are covered in this process? Under our current governance structures, which are quite clunky at COSLA sometimes, um, we have a mandate from 32 leaders, and, 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 and leaders are behind the process of the principle of local discretion for all local authorities. So I, th I think it's incumbent that, that COSLA is the driver and, and pulls everybody in, but obviously the wealth and the value that Adam brings to the table and Jenny brings and Bill brings is incredibly important as well. But I think we have to look upon it as a, an entire local authority discretionary tax, and then the hard work behind the scenes is done by those who wish to implement it or not. And you've, you've touched on the idea that it will maybe only happen in a few if it does happen, and the majority may not choose to go down this route uh, because they would see that as a, a, an extra. And then thinking about the businesses that may have some difficulty, they see themselves because they are marketing and managing their business, trying to cut costs to ensure that they give the best experience they can to. Uh, you, can, you obviously under, un, understand why they feel nervous about the process, uh, because they see this as an extra burden. Uh, how are you going to try and convince them that it's not? So, I, I mean, in our process, it's been involving them in that decision-making process. I mean, today I'm expecting um, businesses, the, the outcome of that meeting with the industry, to come up with their best model of how this it would be implemented. Now, I want to make sure that is as easy for them to operate as possible. Nobody wants uh, every hotel in Edinburgh to have to take on additional administration staff to administer this, so it's about making it absolutely as minimal as possible uh, as of an administrative burden on them, um, and also involve them in everything from the governance and how it's spent and um, the the rate uh, as well within that. So I think engaging the businesses throughout the process as we've done to date and continue to do um, will make our proposition, I think, much stronger. And in some way like Aberdeen, as I say, that has a different and has, as you've indicated, has struggled a bit to try and regain its confidence within the business community. Are you finding it even harder to engage with the business community? No, I don't think that is the case. It's about you having the, 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 the dialogue which, um, and, and selling it to them in effect. You know, because at the end of the day, we've got to show people that this will be advantageous to the area. I think we can do that from the evidence that we've got. And we can't get away from the fact that it is a consumer tax. It's not a business tax. It's a consumer tax. Um, I realise that with the business, we've got to look at how it affects them and the collecting of it and various things. But at the end of the day, local authorities collect tax already. We have revenue and benefits staff who deal with those aspects. We've, from our research, shown that we believe we can deal with it in that way. Businesses are paying various taxes to different governments at different levels um, quite easily, I think, nowadays, particularly with the digital age that we live in. So I, I don't think that's surmountable by any means. I, I mean, but we do need to get back with the, the question around the, the COSLA support. I think local authorities are reaching out to government to say, we require the devolving of powers, whether it's this that we're talking about today or indeed other things, because local accountability is what it's all about going forward. We are on the ground in our local areas, knowing where the priorities lie and where we need to put that investment. Um, you know, I've sort of put my case for Aberdeen as to why, why we want this um, um, in other areas. But I think we have to get back to the fact that we have to trust local authorities to be able to make those decisions on the ground. So in our case, the three uh, councils that are sitting around the table today, we believe this is the way forward for us. If, if we had the powers to do it, we would be bringing it in. Um, obviously in conjunction with the business uh, discussions that we would have, but we see it as a way forward in order to meet the needs of our communities. There'll be other local authorities that have a different perspective on that, but that's what local authorities should be about. It should be about us being able to deal with situations that we have locally, make sure the investment that's required is going into those areas, because that's what will stimulate the economic growth that will support the communities that we're elected to represent. This country doesn't have a very good uh, history and uh, real experience in terms of hypothecated taxa 
taxation. It, it doesn't really happen in this country, but, but what we do have a debate around is, 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 is ring fencing. And certainly since I was elected to this parliament in 2011, one of the constant themes that um, our, our debates are around is that central government has to come in to ring fence certain things, otherwise local authorities won't prioritise them. Um, uh, this committee is a culture committee and the cultural sector often complains that because that they are, they're, they're not statutory, uh, quite often local authorities cut their funding. So how can, uh, can you see that the, because of this, there might be a lack of confidence that despite what you're saying, uh, Councillor Lang, that the money will not go where it's needed? I think that's, that's why it has to be determined locally, because we are the ones that are accountable to our local communities. So if that money is not being invested in the areas that is required for your local community, you won't be on the council for very long, is what I would argue with you. Because, you know, we are accountable to the local community. Um, and, you know, I've argued that we are looking to build up our cultural sector. We are looking to invest in tourism because we see that as a way of boosting our economy going forward. Others will see that their areas of priority may be elsewhere. But if statutory duties are increasing year on year, our uh, finances are reducing year on year, there is less money in which to put into things that are non-statutory. That's why we need to look for ways in which local government has the ability to raise money that then can then be invested in the priorities that we have. Could I make a point on the, the ring fencing and, and priorities nature? Because this is such a disparate picture across the country. Highlands tourism market is very different to Edinburgh's, is very different to Aberdeen's, is very different to Dundee's now. And, uh, you know, we all have similarities but incredible differences. It would be impossible to go down a road of um, ring fencing the priorities to deal with the pressures in each individual area because they are so, so different. Um, some of it's about placemaking, some of it's about infrastructure, some of it's about cultural support in the case of Edinburgh and others. It, it goes beyond any ability to say it's this or it's that, it's a whole host of things. And I think the key point here is that for, certainly for Edinburgh's to be successful, it's gonna have to have that flexibility of change. It's gonna have to have that flexibility of year on year, the industry and key stakeholders saying to us, well, last year it was really important that we invested in festivals to make a, a big show of that, but actually this year it's something else. And can we redirect funds? towards that and it's that flexibility of approach I think that this gives us uh, an ability and an opportunity to really sustain the success that we're all aspiring to. I think we've got a couple of members wanting to come in with supplementaries, uh, Jamie Green and Kenneth. Thank Jamie. you, Kavina. Um Just to sort of... The, 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 the UK hospitality and the STA submission to us said that local government, both individual local authorities and COSLA, has singularly failed to listen to the informed views of an industry that's close to and understands its customers. I quoted the FSB report that said that three quarters of business think it would have a negative impact. Even the Cabinet Secretary for Tourism herself said that we need more investment in infrastructure, but we need to do it in a smart way, not do it in a way that doesn't hammer the tourism industry. So if, if the industry isn't in favour of it, if small businesses that it will affect aren't in favour of it, and it sounds like even the government itself is not uh, supportive. Do you feel like you're fighting a losing battle in this? Um, no, no I, absolutely not. And, and I'll reiterate, we have been engaging with these industry bodies, and we will continue to engage. We're we're at a very early part of this whole process. You know, we, we only had our launch two months ago, and we're now going into a formal consultation process. And, and I think knee jerks need to be relaxed on both sides ever so slightly at the moment and let us have a much wider discussion. Um, but no, absolutely not negative about it. Could I say, listen to the plethora of voices from businesses who are supporting? Yeah. Because in Edinburgh's case, you have international players like Virgin Hotels that are entering the market. They're not operating right now. They're, they're entering the market right now and they support our plans. Airbnb, covering a different set to the market, are supporting uh, our plans. There are big Scottish-based businesses that don't have the international dimension of having experienced this uh, levy elsewhere who are supporting big players in our market. So although um, the industry uh, bodies and some of the industry bodies are keen to play up uh, this consensus, 
it actually doesn't exist. There isn't a consensus in the industry. And while it might be one in four, it might be 50-50, it might be two thirds, one third, but there are industry voices who understand the impact that this could make to supporting the sector. There are industry voices who understand the long-term concern that this is what is needed if we are to sustain that level of success. Because for the industry themselves, and this is a point that hasn't been made, in Edinburgh right now there are three hotels that have either just opened or being built on St Andrew's Square alone. There are hotels being built across our city. The market is expecting continued growth. And if anything threatens that continued growth, the market itself will suffer, the industry itself will suffer, and it takes sustained investment to prolong that. So I think the, the longer term view within the industry, those taking that longer term view and those who understand the benefits to the community and the industry uh, of that investment are actually taking a far more pragmatic and positive and supportive approach. But I have to say, uh, similar to, to Jenny, the industry behind closed doors um, especially one-on-one -on -one with individual businesses are taking a very, very different approach to the less than measured um, contribution by some of the industry bodies, which you will hear. Yes, thanks. So just to touch on an area that's not been covered uh, already, convener, um, in, in its uh, submission, uh, UK Hospitality says, and I quote, imposing an additional tax on visitors who choose to stay in commercial accommodation and make the greatest economic contribution to destination ignores the pressures created by day visitors, in the case of Edinburgh, 18.5 million such visitors per annum. Now, these day visitors obviously contribute to congestion, they use public toilets, they drop litter, it, it, they impact the roads as well. So. How would you address uh, that particular uh, issue? And uh, um, also, if you could just, uh, on the back of that, you talked about um, trying to make Edinburgh, uh, uh, Council McVeigh, an all-year-round destination more. We have more people in November, understandably, in January, February. Is there a possibility that such a tax could even be seasonal, you know, to try and yeah. attract people in quieter times? I think there's any doubt that, that, that in some areas the tax could be seasonal. You know, if you go to some parts of the Highlands, and you look for a tourist in the middle of December, you, mean you might not find one. <laughs> but, but also, with regards to um, simply the, the day visitor, of which we have many, many thousand, and the cruise ships provide day visitors after day visitor after day visitor, and the season is extending and extending. And maybe there are some discussions to be had with the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the shipping industry as to how we could sort of levy some form of payment uh, for these day visitors. Can I come in there? You talked about your roads being churned up. What about camper vans? Whenever I go to the Highlands, that's <laughs> that's where um, I seem to get stuck behind them. But how do you levy the charge on them? Well, obviously, it's quite, it's quite difficult. There is no doubt about it. You, you pick up your camper van in Edinburgh, and yet they're, they're driving away from Edinburgh Airport and they're heading for the Highlands. So it, it would be very difficult for us to... To, to form some form of tax. Maybe Edinburgh can form a tax and they would benefit from it, but, but we wouldn't. But the simple fact of life is that, that their costs uh, on our roads are massive. Their use of our toilets, the fact that they're dumping, or they're having to dump um, their toilet waste in, in remote communities when there are no facilities, faci facilities for them. I think we would just have to compensate for them um, by using different tourism funds. Can I just, I just on that point, sir. Well, I was just going to say, because the industry, we've covered both these issues in direct conversations with industry. In terms of seasonality, it was one of the things we put on the table, asking them, would they prefer when room rates are £300 a night as opposed to 50 it to apply uh, then? Um, the industry very clearly said they wanted it to be um, as simple as possible, and they found it as simple as possible to apply all year round. Um, so that was a case where we were open to either suggestion, we listened to the industry, contrary to <laughs> some industry bodies saying we're not, uh, and we progressed on that basis. Day visitors also became quite a big part of the conversation because uh, our industry quite rightly said there's a big pressure caused by people coming in to the city of Edinburgh. The problem, I think, gets to when you try and look for an international example of this working anywhere in the world, and I can't find anywhere, and I think everyone else was struggling to find somewhere as well. What we have done, though, is engage directly with the attractions of Edinburgh. The, um, the castle, for example, were part of our discussions with the industry and with key stakeholders. So were the airport. So we have continued those discussions with a number of people who have that, um, those visitor numbers going through them. 
to explore what options there are. But I could say, and it almost speaks to the point about camper vans, mm -hmm. there will be 101 things thrown into this debate as reasons that, um, unless it's squared off, um, we, we shouldn't proceed. My view, and it's, um, it's broadly a personal view, but I think it will be shared by uh, most people, is that we need to establish essentially the bulk of the issue in a pragmatic and sensible way, and that is to find the path of uh, least resistance, which is nighttime visitors at a small rate um, applying as simply as possible. And I think that gives us a platform, and if we want to build on that in five years' time and ten years' time, that's absolutely fine. But in the interim, I think it's about making sure we have that investment to invest in the industry. And there may, for instance, be incentives for parts of the industry not covered by immediate legislation to voluntarily uh, be part of it. Because if we're saying to those who are contributing, you get a bigger say in the priorities that this fund is going to, actually, you may end up with people operating in the city of Edinburgh and other places who voluntarily start applying to get trying into that decision-making process. Thanks. Exactly on your point, which was a very good point, uh, and I will be very brief. We do have local authorities who have pressures with camper vans and such like, and COSL is working with them and has been looking at the possibility, again, of local discretion where the hotel room rate fee per night wouldn't apply, that if they're using camping sites and areas like that, perhaps a model of that nature could be brought forward. So again, it comes down to local discretion. What would work in Edinburgh will not work in Argyll and Butte. So I, I think it's all in the round, but as you say, it's not a reason not to do it. It's a reason to find solutions to allow our communities to flourish. Okay, thank you very much. There's many more questions I'm sure we'd like to ask you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you very much to all our uh, witnesses for coming along to give evidence today. And we will be returning to this soon and uh, taking evidence from the sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. We shall now move into private session.